How you going, people? A little review on Brown versus Texas. This is where a case that stopped cops IDing people for no reason. So the facts of the case, Brown leaving in opposite direction in the alley. The cops thought it was a drug high crime area. They tried to stop one of the guys. They asked Brown for his ID. He said, no, you don't have reason to ID me. There, at that time, back in 77, when I was a kid, you had to show ID if a cop said, show me your ID. You had no choice. And it was a law. And if you didn't, you could be arrested. Well, this case changed that. And that's why now people can say, unless you have suspect me of a crime, I don't have to show you ID. This is the case. So Brown uh, ended up challenging and uh, it went to the Supreme Court. And when he was detained, someone refused. The, the question is, when police detain someone because the person refused to identify himself, does it constitute a seizure subject to the restriction of Fourth Amendment? And if you want to hear the case, you can hang around. Basically, it was a unanimous decision. All the justices agreed. Um, the court held that the Fourth Amendment covers all police seizures, even those as brief as preventing a person from walking away. So when they stop you for filming or anything, the Fourth Amendment requires that seizures be based on specific and objectable facts. We usually call those specific object uh, or objectable suspicion. You have to be able to articulate your suspicion. You can't just have a hunch. Facts that create a compelling public interest in the seizure that outweighs the individual's expectation of privacy. Now, the court ruled differently when they can detain you for DUI checkpoints. It's complete opposite of this. I mean, it's crazy that the court can rule this and then they think that cops should be able to stop anybody, everybody on the roadway at DUI checkpoints ID you, detain you, and get information when they don't suspect you of a crime. These are in direct contradiction of each other. But anyway, let's uh, listen to the oral arguments. Case is submitted. We'll hear arguments next in uh, <laughs> Brown against Texas. We need six to proceed. I know, Mr. Chief Justice, and may I please the court... Brown v. Texas is a direct appeal from the County Court at Law No. 2 for El Paso County, Texas. From a misdemeanor conviction for the failure to identify himself an appellant, I'll give a report of his name and address. The facts are that on December 9, 1977, at approximately noon, two uniformed El Paso police patrolmen in a squad car looked down an alley and noticed appellant and another individual who were apparently only a couple of feet apart, walking in opposite directions. There was no report of suspicious or criminal activity. He did not resist the arrest or stop. Brown was patted down then, and no weapons, drugs, or any of the contraband were found. He was later on found guilty in a non-jury trial and was fined $545. Now, the provision in question does not carry any term, jail term or imprisonment, simply provides for a maximum penalty of a $200 fine. The Detroit Ordinance, at least, attempts to put in some sort of a Terry standard that there must be suspicious conduct or criminal conduct afoot, which would allow a police officer to investigate further and ask for one's name. The Texas statute does not have any such requirement. Well, it has the word "lawful." That's correct, Your Honor. Well, if you assume that, this, that if you assume that uh, the Texas courts. Uh, uh, understood uh, what a lawful stop was and convicted this person, uh, you would have thought uh, uh, that as an initial matter, they thought the stop was uh, lawful and and that, therefore, there was at least uh, a, ter a voluntary stop. I think, Your Honor, that if you use the word lawful in a statute such as this, you can, I suppose, read in all kinds of standards. However, to the person reading the statute on its face, well, that's a vagueness argument. Though. That's correct, Your Honor. That's a I know you're making a vagueness argument, but you were just making a a uh, statement that there that, that the Texas uh, statute didn't have any standard in it, different from the. Michigan. What I'm saying is simply by reading in lawful, there is nothing to tell you whether it must be criminal activity, for example. 
It may be that the Texas legislature thought it was lawful for a person, police officer, to stop a person walking down the street and ask him for his name for no other reason. Well, then you, 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 you do are suggesting that neither the Texas legislature nor the Texas courts knew what lawful meant. I'm suggesting they probably didn't consider it carefully enough, Your Honor. The statute is not drafted carefully enough to set forth what is lawful and what is not, and that is one of our principal arguments here. Now, also in DeFilippo, there was evidence of other criminal activity, drunkenness, perhaps some sort of indecency or sexual conduct, uh, possession of drugs, possibly impersonation of a police sergeant. In this case here, we're solely dealing with an offense involving only one type of criminal conduct, and that was the, uh, the offense of failing to identify himself. Now, DeFilippo did not involve a prosecution for failure to identify. This case does involve that kind of prosecution. Also in DeFilippo, of course, there was a question of good faith reliance by the police officer on the ordinance. Before the trial court and before this court, the appellant has challenged the, unconstitu the constitutionality of the Texas statute for facial vagueness and for overbreadth because it punishes not innocent conduct, Your Honor, but protected conduct, and there's a big difference. Conduct protected by the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments to the United States Constitution, making the statute, therefore, invalid under the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. First question is, comes up in the vagueness argument, can a police officer ask someone questions? This is apart from the ability to stop someone. Can he ask someone a question? Point brought up by Mr. Justice White. Well, the answer to that is clearly yes. He, I he agree with you, Your Honor. I agree with that. He has the same rights. I can, I can ask people questions. Well, I can stop a police people. officer can. That's correct. He has the same rights as any other citizen to ask questions. Well, at least those rights. Up to a point, Your Honor, where it becomes harassment or where you're... Uh, but to inquire, what is your name? Simply that point. Uh, for example, if I'm arguing a case up here and a police officer came up to me right now and asked me what is my name, I don't know if that would be a reasonable type of inquiry, Your Honor. I think there are conceivably... Mr. Brown wasn't an argue, arguing a case here, was he? That's correct, Your Honor. I'm, not, I'm saying that conceivably there could be limitations on a person's right to ask questions. But I think as a general proposition, uh, under most fact situations, he does have a right to ask questions. He makes a good point. Uh, can a cop walk up to you and go, hey, man, when was the last time you had sex? Hey, God, do you... Uh, have kinky sex? Hey, does your wife have sex uh, on a park bench? Can an officer walk up and ask those type questions? Or can he ask questions related to an investigation? Or can he ask normal consensual questions like, what time is it? How you doing today? I'm doing fine. What's the weather? Hey, do you, do you know, are you from around here? Do you know where that? I mean, there's a there's a limit to what kind of questions government can ask you. Or there should be. I don't know if there is. Questions. Now, what about the stop? The way I read Davis versus Mississippi, uh, the Fourth Amendment is applicable to any kind of stops. Detentions, arrests, they're all the same, as I understand, the reading of Davis versus Mississippi. Ontario against Ohio said the same thing, didn't it? I believe it did, Your Honor. In that case, uh, I, I can't explain Terry versus Ohio, Judge, Your Honor. The only way I can say it is that under Terry, you're simply trying to protect the life of a police officer who, thinking there is criminal activity afoot, number one, and two, thinking that he might be in a dangerous position, is simply able to pat someone down before he starts asking the questions. Let's in this, move this, for hypothetical purposes, out of the criminal area and say that uh, a police car is uh, uh, called to uh, an automobile collision and... Uh, there are a number of people around. Uh, do you suggest that uh, the state has no police power to require the persons who observe that automobile collision to give their names? Uh, to I agree. The state shouldn't be requiring people who don't want to be a witness, who don't want to cooperate, who don't want to get involved. I, I don't think the state should be able to do that, my opinion. The police officer? No, oh, Your Honor, I'm not suggesting that. That's the problem with this case, that it's not limited to civil or criminal incidents. And what I suggested to the court in my brief was that Texas used to have a pr the predecessor statute, which was not a penal statute, kind of a material witness type statute, 
provided that a police officer could round up the witnesses to a, to a civil or criminal incident, which... Well, then, then, just to take one step at a time, the First Amendment is no barrier to, to a statute requiring a person to identify himself to a police officer at high noon uh, with no criminal activity going on. Your Honor, the statute that I'm talking about does not make you identify yourself. You have a choice of doing two things. First, you can identify yourself, or if you stand mute and refuse to identify yourself, then the officer must take before a neutral magistrate, at that time make provision for a material witness bond, or to identify yourself. But no statute, I'm not suggesting to this Court that any statute, civil or criminal, can make you, under the pain of criminal violation, state what your name is or say anything. Anything that comes from your mouth, as far as I am concerned, Your Honor, is a violation of both the First and Fifth Amendments, if it's orally compelled. But uh, then if you refuse to do that before the magistrate in this hypothetical situation, then what? Then he places you under a material witness bond. If you can't make bond, then uh, you're in jail, Your Honor. Now, I suggest to you that that pretty well washes out the First Amendment arguments you're making. Well, let me, let me talk about the First Amendment then, Your Honor. Let's assume that you have the fact situation of NAACP v. Alabama. That is the situation where you have a group of persons who, for their own protection, are trying to unite and, uh, let's say, get rid of racial segregation, which was the case there. And the state was violently opposed, to, at that point at least, to the NAACP. And you want to find out, as a state officer, who the members are of the NAACP. Now, this court held under NAACP v. Alabama that you could, a court could not compel NAACP to give up its membership lists. I'm suggesting to this court that there is a First Amendment violation potentially here. If I could stop every single person who had attended a, an NAACP meeting on their way out of the meeting and ask them, what is your name? If the person refuses to give his name, then I march him on down to jail, have him fingerprinted, and try to ascertain their identification through some of the means. I am suggesting, Your Honor, that there is a First Amendment violation. Wasn't that decided, at least in part, though, on the theory of the freedom to assemble and petition for redress of grievances? In NAACP, yeah. they, they spoke more broadly than that, Your Honor. I believe they said that privacy in one's associations are involved in the freedom of the association, that in some instances your freedom to associate is endangered if the privacy is not there. The Iranian student type thing, or the, uh, your ability to, to redress and to protest anonymously, Your Honor. Here, here, your client, I take it, wasn't engaged in any comparable activity to that in NAACP versus Alabama. No, Your Honor, I think my client's activity is closer and still First Amendment protected right, which this court decided in Norwell versus Cincinnati, where a police officer approached a, a gentleman walking under with a suspicious person acti uh, report afoot, and he stopped Mr. Norwell, and he asked him, what he was doing there at that time of night, and Mr. Norwell simply said, I don't tell you anything, in those words. And this court held that was protected activity at the non-provocative protest of an arrest. And I think my case is closer yes, to that. Did that go off on freedom of speech? I believe that you just said it was protected activity. I can your, only assume. Your, your man here is arrested for, not what, for what he said, but for what he didn't say. Well, he did say something, Your Honor. And he did pretty well, much the same. Arrested for that. Pardon me, Your Honor? Is he arrested for what he did say? They didn't see, he was arrested for what he did not say. Yes, that's that's correct. But he did say something, and that was that he protested the right and reason of the, of the officers to detain him under the circumstances in this case. By implication, if you say, to take the question earlier, what lawfully means, by implication, if I only have to give my name under the Texas statute when I am lawfully stopped, it would mean that if I am not lawfully stopped, then I don't have to give my name. Now, when and is one person supposed to know that he is not lawfully stopped? Under the Settles case, under Terry, under Davis versus Mississippi, a person, uh, let's assume you had a constitutional scholar walking down the street and he knew about those cases. Well, when is some, somebody supposed to know uh, uh, when there is probable cause to arrest? You're not, you're, you don't. You're simply arrested. That's a fact. But in this case, Apparently, a person has an option, at least for a little while, to think, is this a lawful arrest or is it not? When well, let me ask you, what if the, uh, uh, what, 
uh, what if there's probable cause? Uh, what if a policeman thinks there's probable cause to arrest and he arrests him? Then he and he asks him his name. You think the state could then uh, make the refusal to give the name a crime? Right, Your Honor. Then you're getting into a different area, Your Honor. Well, could you or not? No, I don't think you can, Your Honor, because it's still because it would be vague. Activity. Because it no. would be vague. No, Your Honor. That's getting out of the vagueness. Uh, you're getting into the area of overbreath because at that point what you're doing is you're making criminal conduct which is protected by the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments, not because of vagueness. You're setting aside the vagueness argument at that point. Now, the California statute, the Detroit ordinance in this case, the Henderson City ordinance, all kind of incorporate a little bit better than this statute does the Terry-type criteria. In this case, there is nothing that I don't think I don't think you could read anything near Terry into the words lawfully in this case. Also, what uh, is a... Mr. Commandier, could I just ask this? You, you didn't challenge the uh, lawfulness of the stop in this case, did you? By filing a motion to suppress, I did not. I challenged the statute on its face, Your Honor. So that uh, the lawfulness, then, uh, we assume? I think that my client's activity, let's say in this case... If they did have probable cause to stop my client, I could still challenge the statute. I don't think you can assume lawfulness in this case. What I'm saying is that there may conceivably be cases where it would not be a lawful stop. This may or may not be a lawful stop. I'm not conceding, and it did not at the trial court. Why didn't challenge it? I did, Your Honor. I said at page 25, page 18 of the record, if the purpose of the stop was I want to ask this fellow's name, then, of course, I would contend that's, that that's not the lawful purpose. That's in the middle of page 18 of the record. I have never conceded that this stop was lawful. Well, you go on to say I'm assuming the state here, through its police officers, had some reason to make an initial stop. That's correct. At that point, I didn't know you, Your Honor. I hadn't heard the evidence, and that was before the trial. But I have never consume, uh, assumed or conceded that this was a lawful stop in this case. But go up a step further. What about after the trial? Did you argue that it was not a lawful stop? Your Honor, I have all... No, I did not. I have always argued that the statute well, on its face... On its face is bad, but now, what do we do with your argument? If, if we should view the, and there's no element of dangerousness in the situation, as I remember the facts... That's correct. What if, what if our view would be that this did not come within Terry? What do we do with the case? The reason I attacked it on, the, on its face, Your Honor, I can see, I can, I, t I, my position before this court, this is the same kind of case as C versus Seattle and Camara versus Municipal Court of San Francisco. And that is, in those cases, you're attempting to make criminal a person's invocation of his rights under the Fourth Amendment. No motion to suppress, no nothing. Simply a, an attack on the invalidity of the statute on its face. I don't believe you have to have a motion to suppress in order to raise facial invalidity on Fourth Amendment grounds, and you did not have to have it in C versus Seattle or Camara versus Municipal Court. What I'm, I'm saying not is... I'm sure you answered my question, but maybe that's... Well... Does it make any difference whether we, in fact, view the stop as lawful or not? No, Your Honor, not if you're looking at the state so you at the can statute. For the purposes it. of our decision, you concede it's a lawful stop, is what you're saying. This, this case here may have been a valid stop. May, you can assume that it was. That's correct, Your Honor. For my purposes, I'm arguing... And then you'd also assume for purposes of decision that every judge who has to read this statute would know what the Terry standard is and would limit the application of the statute to those cases which fall within the Terry standard. We should assume that, I suppose. You would have to assume that, but for purposes of... Then it doesn't seem very vague anymore. For I thought purpose, part of the vagueness was we didn't really know whether they limited it to Terry stops or not. Well, my understanding of the term vagueness, Mr. Justice Stevens, is that a person reading the statute would be able to tell whether his conduct was criminal or not. I thought that was a test of vagueness, not whether a court somewhere knew what Terry versus Ohio held. But maybe you know, I misunderstood it, but that's what I thought vagueness meant. May I come back to the question you've just been discussing? Uh, one of the elements in this statute is that the stop must be lawful. Uh, that's what the statute says. I realize you uh, argue that lawful uh, could mean a lot of things. But it seems to me from, from the record uh, that uh, that element of the offense uh, may be absent in this case. Uh, the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Patton, on page 15 of the appendix, uh, concedes that uh, the stop must be lawful. Uh, 
he said an officer cannot go up go up to anyone on the street and ask for his name unless the stop is lawful. And if you look at what the officer said uh, back on page 28 and later 31, uh, I think in response to your questions, uh, at the bottom of page 28, uh, you inquired, did you, uh, was there any action by my client that he was armed or committed a crime at that time? The answer was no. Well, if he didn't commit a crime, how would it be lawful? Um, I mean, this case isn't, man, this case is kind of like arguing with itself almost. The only thing you wanted to do was to stop him and ask him for his name, and the answer was correct. So doesn't that wash uh, the element of a lawful stop out of this case altogether? In this case, if you were to, if I were to have said my conducts, the, co the conduct of my client in this case was protected, he, it was not criminal, that would be correct, Your Honor. But if you're raising facial invalidity and vagueness, <clears throat> I would say no, Your Honor. Well, I understand uh, that perhaps, but uh, why do you have to get to the constitutional issue? If an element of the, of, the, of the statutory offense is by concession absent. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I... You don't have to get to the constitutional issue. Or you can simply, uh, the, the court below could have entered a judgment of acquittal, and I suppose uh, this well, court... we have to have some constitutional basis for setting aside a state conviction. I don't care what kind of a, uh, I, I do care what, what, what the ground might be, but there has to be some constitutional ground. Well, then that's and are you suggesting that there wouldn't, that, that, that it was without any evidence that, whatsoever? Is that, I'm would not it suggesting. Would be a Fourth Amendment or what? Your Honor, the constitutional grounds would be basically 14th Amendment due process, which would also bring in the First, Fourth, and, four, and Fifth Amendments. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you not reach the constitutional issue in this case. That was simply. Uh, but I, I take it that whatever, uh, uh, whatever level of suspicion there might have been in this case, I mean, the state courts have apparently said that under the statute it's enough. Uh, and uh, so that poses uh, uh, at least the constitutionality of the statute as applied. Yes, Your Honor, on its, as applied and also on its face. Well, on its face, Mr. Caballero, I noticed you in your index of authorities in the front of your brief, the only Texas case you cite is one saying that the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals has jurisdiction only where the fine level is over $100. And it very likely is not your fault that you can't get to a higher Texas appellate court. Have there, but have, have there been any Texas appellate decisions construing the statute? No, Your Honor. The, 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 this question came up earlier, and I can answer your question, I believe, in this manner. If the statute provides a pretext for an arrest, such as, for example, in DeFilippo, you find drugs or other violations. You never see this kind of prosecution arise. This is a very rare instance. I don't even know how it got this far. But you so what he's saying here is if there's another crime, when the cops do these unlawful stops and IDs, if they find another serious crime, then they don't charge them with failure to ID. They take the higher, which is very common, which is why a lot of lower crimes that shouldn't be in the, in the books is very hard to get rid of because they're only charged very rarely when you have nothing else or when you're pleading down or something. So, I mean, it's a good point, but I'm still, the case doesn't seem, the justices almost seem like they're like, hey, as long as stop was lawful, it's already covered. We're not going to rule. Yet, they all rule unanimously that this guy's right. Doesn't sound like it, but they do. Usually, at that point, prosecutors... Uh, uh, Mr. Cavalier, it's because you brought it here. Well, Your Honor, I only was <laughs> defending my client. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, the only thing I can say is that, at that point, prosecutors are simply not interested in prosecuting someone for the mere refusal to give his name. And, uh, and you don't see this kind of prosecution. No Texas appellate court, to my knowledge, and I've checked, has ever considered the issue. In Sunny Settles versus Texas, that I've cited in my reply brief, they didn't cite the statute. But the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals did give you its viewpoint concerning the lawfulness of stopping someone on the street and asking their name. And, and unless you get a fine of over $100, you will never get a case to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Under that's this correct, Your Honor. So that's pretty slick of Texas back then. As long as we keep the fine under $100, nobody can appeal whether we're right or wrong.
Well, that's kind of convenient. Remember, the whole purpose of the Supreme Court is to defend and protect the Constitution. The Constitution limits government. The judicial branch, the Supreme Court, is a check and balance on the executive and congressional uh, or legislative branch, Congress, on keeping them to stop abusing or overreaching on co the Constitution. I mean, the, the Supreme Court should be the biggest enemy of the government. It should not be their assistant and working with them. Although, that's not what we see today. Now, somewhere in your observations, you said that the police officer gave no explanation except that he wanted his name. Uh, I, I suggest that isn't quite accurate. The police officer said that at page 29, of just above the middle, uh, he referred to this being a high drug area. Uh, and it is, uh, this is certainly related to the reason he made the stop. That's part of the officer's explanation. He, he gave that explanation, Your Honor. I don't see that anyone's Fourth Amendment rights are diminished in any respect because he happens to be walking through a so-called high drug area. I don't think you lose <coughs> any of your Fourth Amendment rights because well, you happen to be walking through. Great point. Great point. You shouldn't lose your rights just because where you happen to walk, either mistakenly or in pro on purpose. Uh, uh, you're going to the legal argument, which is your, your, your privilege. I'm simply suggesting that the officer did give a reason. The reason was that he was being more observant in a high drug area when two people come together in an alley. Obviously, uh, because they might be engaged in a drug transaction. Obviously. And obviously they could have known each other and been engaged in friendship, relationship, sharing experiences. I mean, for them to just automatically say, well, in a high drug, obviously they're doing drugs. That's not true. That's a pretty big leap. They might not be, but that's his, there is a reason given by the officer. That was just a, suspicion. a frivolous or whimsical idea. If that were the case, though, Your Honor, I would imagine that he wanted to stop the other party to the drug transaction and also ask him a question or two, which they never did. Oh, another good point. If the officers were consistent and being honest and they thought it was a drug activity, how come they didn't stop both people? Maybe there's an answer, but that's a great point. I guess they assumed that the drugs were flowing from um, my client to the other, which in the case, if, if they really did believe that and they wanted to make a drug arrest, they would certainly stop both parties. If they thought my client sold, then is the other party any, would have them. Is there any evidence what happened to the other man? The only thing in the record was he was never stopped or questioned, Your Honor. Very well, Mr. Calderon. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Renee Hicks, and I represent the state of Texas on this appeal. The statute challenged here. Okay, so this is the government defending the government. Here is section 3802A of the Texas Penal Code. And just generally, it imposes a very limited duty on citizens of the state of Texas in very narrowly circumscri circumscribed situations to aid police in their investigatory uh, functions and indirectly to aid their fellow citizens by helping to uh, possibly preempt crime or help uh, uh, catch those who have just committed a crime. Um, I do not see that it is unconstitutional under any of the four grounds that were raised on this appeal. Uh, the First Amendment issue, I think... Of course he doesn't see there's anything wrong. He's working for government. He wants government to have the power to do more. He wants to be able to compel pesky citizens to give up their rights because that pesky document, the Constitution, is always getting in the way of government helping people, saving them, public safety, national security. We need the government just to have more power. If they could only get the guns, we'd all be safe. I think uh, clearly must be uh, discarded. Uh, as a valid grounds for invalidating the statute because to invalidate uh, the statute because saying that someone has a First Amendment right to silence in all situations 
uh, just would lead to totally unacceptable results throughout our society. We <laughs> totally unacceptable results in our society. Guess what? That's what they rule. Our, much of our government functions on requirements that people respond to requests from people uh, in securities and exchange matters, uh, in Food and Drug Administration matters and situations like that. Well, what if what if the uh, state of Texas passed a statute saying that every citizen, when he left home during the day, had to call the local police station, tell him he was leaving and where he was going and when he'd be back, and made a viol made a, a violation of that command, a criminal offense, punishable by a fine? I don't see that that would be a First Amendment problem. It seems to me, well, it, it could be a First Amendment problem in the sense of uh, impinging somewhat on associational rights by constantly keeping track of someone. I, I don't think this, this statute does anything like that. But it, if, if anything, I It almost sounds like he'd be okay with that. <laughs> Unbelievable. I would think that that would be a general due process problem with the statute. Going back to the situation in Dave Filippo where mm -hmm. the Michigan Court of Appeals said making criminal that kind well, of what is in general due process well I, by that I meant the 14th amendment due process question uh, this court has held in numerous kinds of cases that uh, the, the only things in the due process clause are not rights incorporated from the first ten amendments first eight amendments to pursue Mr. Justice Rehnquist's uh, hypothetical under this kind of an ordinance, the really only safe way that a citizen can avoid embarrassment, at least, is to carry some form of identification on him at all times. Isn't that true? I don't think that's so. Uh, think this so. statute is different uh, than many of the other statutes that are similar to this in that there's nothing on the face of the statute that says someone has to carry identification to support what they speak to the officer. In other words, there's no requirement of, of showing a validated driver's license or no requirement to show anything, but they do think there's a requirement you must tell them. And if you lie, that's another crime. And if you don't tell them, you're arrested. A general ID card. It just says a person must report his name and residence address to a police officer. Uh, and I don't think the word report in this instance means that uh, they have to report it by showing proof of the identification. In other words, if someone says my name is uh, John Smith to an officer who's lawfully requested it, uh, the officer has no right to say, well, prove that you're John Smith. Well, that's not necessarily true. Because if I ask you your name is John Smith and then I run you, and I can't find a John Smith, then I think you're lying, then I think you're obstructing my investigation, then I arrest you for obstruction of a police officer. So he may say you don't have to prove it, but if the officer can't prove it, you're going to jail. And he has no right to arrest the person unless he has independent grounds <coughs> to prove that this is a false identification. Well, counsel, I take it then you're, you're suggesting that we should judge this case on the grounds that... Uh, that the, the, the validity of the statute on the grounds that the statute permits an officer to stop any person at any time, regardless of the circumstances, and ask his name, and if the person refuses uh, to arrest him. No, Your Honor, I'm not saying that. The statute requires that there be a lawful stop. Well, yes, I'm, thinking, well I'm just asking, though, I'm asking then, is it, is, is it a lawful stop to just stop any person indiscriminately and ask the name? Well, it may not be an unlawful stop. Yeah, see, he, he just avoided the question. Is it lawful to stop anybody? Well, it may not be unlawful. Really? But I, I do think that the word lawful stop, in this instance, ha carries with it a certain technical meaning, the Terry versus Ohio type but, of but stop. The court in this case held that this was a lawful stop. It had to hold so in order to convict this person. That was implicit in the judgment of conviction, yes, Therefore, Your Honor. that's the way we have to read the statute, isn't it? I, I don't believe so, Your Honor. Well, Under, why not? Well, well for, it, there is trying to help you out. I understand that. <laughs> but I do believe that the lawful stop requires a Terry versus Ohio stop. It may be that the court in this situation 
uh, did not read it that way, but it is not an appellate court in it's the state the of Texas. the highest court in which we have any construction of, of this Texas statute. That's we correct. Had, as my brother Rehnquist suggests, we're not likely to get it from any higher court. Well, it is possible to get it's it from the higher court. possible. We haven't yet. Correct. And this is the sole construction of the statute we have, that, uh, that, the, that the stop by this policeman of this petitioner was a lawful stop, or else there couldn't have been a conviction. I think that's correct. And if you assume the, they knew what the law was, you would, you would think it was a, at least a Terry stop? Is that it? That, that is my argument before this court. It, it is possible that there was not, that this court would find, if it was independently reviewing the evidence, that there was not a lawful Terry versus Ohio stop. What if the El Paso County Court says lawfully stopped under this statute means lawful for purposes of federal constitutional law as well as Texas law, and I conclude this was a valid Terry stop. And this court, which is hearing the case now, says, no, we do not think it was a valid Terry stop. We would, would simply reverse on an as-applied basis, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that, that it's the issue of the lawful stop has constantly been pushed to the background by Mr. Brown or his counsel. And it is not really before this court whether there was a lawful stop. I realize under Thompson versus City of Louisville, this court has said that it can be a denial of due process if there's no evidence to support a conviction. That wouldn't be the necessarily the ground. It would just be that the evidence isn't enough to justify a Terry stop. <coughs> I understand. But you don't think you don't think you, you say that issue wasn't presented in the. It 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 was not. It was covered by the fact that uh, Mr. Brown's attorney said that he assumed that there was a lawful. Uh, there was a reason to stop. Well, if he assumed it, uh, if he assumed the reason and then wanted the constitutionality passed on, he didn't present the lawfulness of the stop. That's my argument. May I just ask you a question on that? He did ask the question, as Mr. Justice Powell pointed out. The only thing he wanted to do was stop him and ask him his name. And the officer said, correct. That's on page 28. And he says the same thing again a couple of pages later. I really have, have two problems with that. Can you, does not the record show the absence of a lawful Terry stop? Great point. If the officer testified all I wanted to do was stop and ask his name, then what makes it a lawful stop? If that's the fact. I think that's very possible. I do think that there were two other facts. Th then if, if that is true, if, it, if there is, as we can read the records, there just isn't any indication of violence and no motive to do anything but ask this fellow's name, and he, and he happened to be in a drug area and he happened to be black, and I don't know which is more significant as far as the reason for the stop, but do we just ignore that then? Or do we, and, and what can be done if it, is, if it is not actually a violation of the statute? There's no appeal in Texas, is there, from this court? Well, there is, but there wasn't in this case. Uh, oh, there, oh, I thought because the amount involved, there, there was no. There can be an appeal because under class, in a Class C misdemeanor, there can be a fine over $100. Oh, I see, if it had been over 100, to 200. But, in, but the judgment here is not reviewable by any court. That's correct. Uh, well, I, I do think that uh, it's very well that there may not have been a lawful stop in this case. Ha, 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 ha. So if the statute says you could stop an ID with a lawful stop and this guy just admitted it wasn't a lawful stop, maybe that's why they all voted unanimously. I, I, I can only go back to the, to the position. But that then isn't Mr. it, as, don't counsel, we then have to assume as a matter of Texas law that the Texas court, which is the final court construing this statute, has held that it applies yes. more broadly than Terry does? Yes. It's, it's, there are two conclusions, that, two possible conclusions that could be drawn, I think. One could be that conclusion, um, and I don't think that that's the proper one. The other one would be, I would think, that the court misunderstood or misapplied the Terry Doctrine. The court, the trial court, did not apply the Terry Doctrine properly. That might be the proper one, and I, I believe that that is what's supported by the record. The reason I say that under the Texas statute, under you, this statute... Are, are you conceding that? I'm saying that this court very well might find that there was not a lawful stop under Terry versus Ohio if it was independently reviewing the evidence and if the issue was clearly presented to it. You don't have to review a whole lot of evidence. The officer stated he only stopped him because he wanted to ID him. 
I do think that the Texas statute requires a Terry versus Ohio stop. There's no indication in this case that it does. None. In fact, all the indications are the other way, the very fact that this person was convicted on the facts of this case. Well, again, I think that the other, there's another conclusion that can be drawn, and that is that it was misapplied. The Terry doctrine was misapplied. Well, but you have no basis for submitting that this law requires at least a justification equivalent to it. See, what they're trying to argue is that because we put a lawful stop in our section, most people will think lawful means Terry versus Ohio. But since we didn't say that, lawful can be whatever the court determines, and if the court keeps the fine under $100, then you can't appeal. And I don't think that when somebody did this law, they were thinking that way, but over time, in order to prevent losing the law, because government always protects what power and laws they have, they never want to give it up, it turned into that case. The Terry against Ohio. There's I, no I think basis I in this case for saying so. In this case, but in Texas statutes, for instance, in the Texas Code Construction Act, which governs the Texas Penal Code, there is provision in the Texas Code Construction Act which says that if terms of a statute have a technical or special meaning through uh, some means, such as a court decision, such as Terry versus Ohio, it doesn't specifically mention Terry versus Ohio, then those words in a statute are to be given that construction. Well, Terry against Ohio, in that case, uh, the court upheld what the police officer did. Uh, there was no, there was no statute or ordinance covering uh, what That's he did. Uh, it didn't say that he couldn't have done more or less. It just simply upheld what he did. Why, why are you suggesting that that's a limit of what a police officer can ever do? I'm not saying that that's a limit of well, what a police officer can ever do. Well, you just did. No, I, I, I believe I said that under this statute, the term lawful stop is limited by other, other statutes in Texas that control the construction that the state courts would be able to give this statute to a situation of there being a, ter a Terry versus Ohio stop. I since Terry. Well, that's, that's telling us that Terry against Ohio represents the limit of what a lawful stop would be, isn't it? I don't think that that's a necessary conclusion from what I just said about the construction that would be given to this statute. Uh, there are stops that might not amount to a Fourth Amendment detention that would be termed lawful, I suppose. I mean, policemen constantly are patrolling their areas, checking with the merchants and so on. Is it your view that the Texas court concluded that there was a lawful stop here? Yes. I think that that is implicit in the judgment of conviction. And what they're arguing here is since the statute says upon a lawful stop, an officer can ask for your ID, and if you refuse, you're going to get arrested. So because the court convicted him, they had to either find or ignore that the stop was lawful. He couldn't have convicted, could he? That's correct. Now, in reaching that conclusion, uh, and certainly Hornbook, uh, that uh, the, the whole record is viewed by that judge, not necessarily by us, but by that, the judge reaching that conclusion. And part of that record is that this somewhat inarticulate policeman and a brand new... <laughs> he just slammed the cop because the cop made a crappy argument. See, if the cop would have said, I was in a high crime area, I saw actions and movements, which I've seen before when drug transactions happened, I saw a transfer of money, or I saw what appeared to be a transfer of some object, which could have been money for drugs, it led me to believe that I thought a drug transaction was going on. Therefore, I conducted an investigatory stop because I thought crime was afoot, and I wanted to ID the participants. If the cop had said that, they wouldn't be arguing this. And that's why I always tell cops, words matter. You need to be articulate. Other people come here and go, man, you like to hear yourself talk. No, no, no. I like to be very articulate and make sure people understand because they will come back and pick your words apart and your sentences and what you left out and what you failed to say and only take what you said out of context and they forget that most all laws and all court and all proceedings and convictions are based on totality of the circumstances. And you, the only way the court knows the totality of the circumstances is if officers are articulate enough 
to make sure the court understands the totality of the circumstances. Policeman as well said that part of his motivation implied that part of his motivation was that it was in a high drug area. Is it reasonable to conclude? Do you think we could conclude that the judge made the decision that the lawfulness was demonstrated in relation to the high drug area that the policeman said was part of his reason? I believe that 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 is one of the factors on which the judge based his conclusion implicit in the judgment of conviction. Is that that decision reviewable here? I don't believe it is, Your Honor. That that is my point, that there there are there is some evidence on the point of whether there is a lawful stop. As I say, this court reviewing the record or as initial trial court might decide that there was not proof beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a lawful stop. But there were two factors, I think, here. One was that it was a high drug area. The other factor, there were three factors. The other factor was that these people were in an unpaved alley. And the other factor was that there were two people in this unpaved alley in a high drug problem area. How the hell does an alley being paved or unpaved make reasonable suspicion? What the hell? One another. Now, those three factors in isolation very well, in fact, probably are not a lawful stop in Terry v. Ohio. Hell no, it's not lawful. How do you articulate that a paved, unpaved alley is suspicious? That's the government's job to pave the alley. Now, because they don't want to pave the alley in a high crime area, suddenly it's suspicious? Wow. They are some evidence on that point. And that is the reason I suggest that under Thompson v. Louisville, the conviction could not be reversed because there is no evidence on the point. And I do not believe that because a judge in Texas may have applied Terry v. Ohio in a way differently than this court might have, that that means that that court was saying that lawful stop means something different in Texas than it means under the Fourth Amendment litigation after Terry v. Ohio. But you're not contending here, then, that you can make it a crime, that a state could make it a crime to refuse to give your name whenever you're stopped for whatever reason or no reason? I'm not contending that it can make it a crime. That is correct. I'm not contending that Texas has done that. I think it may be possible to do that. Suppose there were no reference by the policeman in this record to the fact that he was observing two men in an alley in a high drug area and that there was nothing in the record except that he just wanted to find out the man's name. Would you think that would be a lawful stop, a permissible stop under this statute? Permissible first. No. I would not say that that would have been a lawful stop under this statute, and I would say that there would have been no evidence to support a conviction in that situation. Well, you may say that, but that's basically what the court did, is they made a determination based on weak articulation from the officers because of an unpaved alley that it was suspicious. Therefore, they ruled that it was a lawful stop because the statute said it must be lawful, and they made it a crime for this guy not to ID him, and they gave him a fine under $100 so he couldn't appeal. Nah. Look, if we just give government the guns, things will get so much better. Government's always got our best interests. Come on, people, keep up. Well, there would have been plenty of evidence to support a conviction of refusing to give your name if he refused to give his name. But that is only one of several elements in the statute. Again, I go back to arguing that it's a Terry v. Ohio stop that is suggested. There wouldn't be any evidence of a lawful stop. That is correct. There would have been no evidence on that point. Well, the difficulty with the case is that we don't have an opinion from the Texas court, and so we don't know whether it's a question of interpretation of the state statute that may be troublesome constitutionally or whether it's an evaluation of the evidence under a perfectly permissible interpretation of the state statute. I think that that is one of the main problems in this case. I do think that there is support in Texas law, statutory law, for the argument that this is a Terry v. Ohio stop. And again, I cite the Texas Code Construction Act, which governs the Texas Penal Code. 
and which says that technical terms or, or terms that have acquired special meaning retain that special meaning in the codes of Texas. And there is also a provision that Texas courts are to construe statutes so as to avoid findings of unconstitutionality, a kind of black letter law problem. I did want to uh, address the problem of Norwell versus Connecticut, uh, which uh, Mr. Caballero cited as supporting the, his First Amendment argument. And I do believe that reading of that case will reflect that the gentleman that was convicted of disorderly conduct in that case had his conviction reversed by this court because of something he had said. It was his his conviction was not Norwell reversed because of something he had said. Cincinnati. No. Cincinnati. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, it, was because, it was a First Amendment question because it, the record reflected in that case that he was convicted for what he had said, not for violation of the statute. He had non-provocatively responded to the officers accosting him. In this, situ in this case, the record reflects that he was arrested simply for refusing to give his name after a lawful stop by the police officer. I uh, did want to d uh, also distinguish this case from cases such as Papa Cristo and the other cases that have held vagrancy statutes unconstitutional because this statute punishes <coughs> conduct, not status. I think there's an important difference. Uh, in Papa Cristo, the statute was held unconstitutionally vague because underlying that decision, I think, was the, was the uh, feeling that people were convicted for what they were, not for what they had done. I don't believe that is the situation in this case. I also wanted to point out that uh, there is a mens rea requirement in this statute. It requires an intentional refusal. I think this distinguishes this somewhat from the De Filippo case, which did not clearly contain a mens rea requirement. Uh, and I think the uh, intentional uh, element, the mens rea requirement, does under various decisions of this court save the statute from any vagueness that this court might find otherwise. But that presupposes that, presupposes that there is a, a valid obligation to answer the question, what is your name, and identify yourself. Well, I do believe that is a valid obligation. I don't... Well, this, this statute makes it an obligation. Yes, and I, as I say, I believe it is a valid statute and the obligation is fair. Uh, it, it's, it's not asking, I don't believe, too much to ask citizens in these narrowly circumscribed, circumscribed situations to aid uh, the law enforcement community in investigating possible crimes. Aid law enforcement. How many times have we seen people aiding law enforcement end up getting shot, killed, become a criminal? And then if you aid them, then they subpoena you. And if you don't come, you're a criminal because you violated a subpoena. An arrest warrant is issued because you were aiding law enforcement. They have made it a crime or ignorance to aid law enforcement because they prosecute everybody. When you turn everybody in the criminal, there's no legal citizens left, which is basically what they're doing with all the extra gun laws and all the extra ways they're trying to take guns from people. If you make everybody a criminal and criminals can't own guns, that's how we'll get gun control. If there's reasonable suspicion to stop. That's correct. But if there's not? If there's not reasonable suspicion, I believe that it's a different case than this one. And I believe, as the discussion in, De Filippo, in the De Filippo argument preceding this one indicated, that it's quite possible for a state to enact a statute making it a crime whether there's a lawful stop or not to refuse to give your name. Well, I, I, again, I don't believe that's that that's contrary, an issue for this court. what I understood you to answer a few minutes ago, that you didn't think a state could validly do that. I don't, I don't believe I said that. I may have well, I misunderstood you then. I believe it may be possible. I, again, I'm, I'm not, argue, I'm not trying to argue that statute. you're telling us that this statute doesn't go that far. I, that's correct. Well, if, if, we happen to, if we happen to think the issue of the lawfulness of the stop was properly here in the sense, was there Terry grounds for stopping? If that issue is here and we decided there were not sufficient uh, uh, grounds to make a Terry stop, then before we could reverse, we would have to say that a state may not that's right. make a person identify himself on less than Terry grounds. That's right. And that's exactly what they rule. That's correct. And buyers against California, uh, 
of course, did require a man to identify himself, but that was uh, in relation to the driving of an automobile, wasn't it? That's correct, and it involved, it involved a penal statute, but it, it did involve a situation where there had been an accident of some sort. And I believe in under, although the issue wasn't presented in Byers, there could have been grounds for a probable Texas, stop in situation. A, it's probably unlawful in Texas for an eyewitness to a murder to refuse to identify himself, I suppose. That's correct. I believe that's so. Uh, if, if at, at the uh, scene or within the general surroundings of the murder, several months later it may be different. We'll resume at 1 o'clock. Thank you. All right. Very well. You may resume. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. Uh, the last uh, argument that I would like to address, or the last... Looks like there's uh, 10 minutes left. The last issue that I'd like to address is, just briefly, is the Fifth Amendment issue that was raised in the brief on appeal by uh, Mr. Brown's attorney. I just wanted to re uh, point out that this is an attack on the statute on its face uh, on all issues, and not in particular at this point, on the Fifth Amendment question. And uh, the Fifth Amendment self privilege against self-incrimination is not a right that can be asserted vicariously on behalf of large groups of people. This Court has many times held that it is a, is a personal privilege that must be asserted. Which brings me to my second point on this, and that is that Mr. Brown, nowhere in the proceedings until uh, the motion to dis set aside the information was filed, uh, invoked the Fifth Amendment. In fact, on the way down to the uh, uh, booking station, he told them his name. Uh, another point I would like to make is under California versus Byers, uh, at least in a plurality opinion, this court has written that a person's name and his address is just a neutral item of information which is not incriminating in any way and it can be an analogized to uh, the taking of blood samples, uh, the exhibition of the person at a lineup in such situations. Uh, one question that has not come up here so far and uh, was brought up in the DeFilippo case, I think Mr. Justice White asked it, was what about uh, the Miranda situation? Uh, is it required that Miranda warnings be given? And I did want to point out that Miranda uh, spoke briefly to this issue when it said that it did not apply to general on-the-scene questioning uh, in circumstances where a crime might have been committed or something like that. Of course, so the I crime wasn't committed until after the When he's talking about Miranda, Miranda basically says falls in if I am questioning you to about your innocent or guilt or involvement of a crime. That's where Miranda comes in. Miranda doesn't come in if I say, hey, man, uh, you're under arrest. Oh, you got to read my rights. Okay. Yo, man, you got the time? That's not a Miranda issue because it doesn't go to your innocent or guilt. question was asked. Well, that's true. This particular crime was not. And... Uh, what I was saying is, as going back to my argument that a lawful stop means a Terry versus Ohio stop, Miranda seemed to say that in a situation like that, you don't need to give uh, Miranda warnings because general on-the-scene questioning is not covered. I think Oregon versus, versus Mathiasen kind of expanded this idea. Mr. Uh, Hickson, wasn't that because the person just generally on the scene wasn't necessarily in custody? And Miranda starts when the when the person being well, questioned. Well, that's true, out. but what I'm saying is uh, a person that's reasonably stopped. That's what I was next going to ask you. When, if you do stop a person and <clears throat> pat him down, is he in custody for purposes of the Miranda case? I do not think so. Oh, I don't know about that. If I stop you and detain you, and I ask you questions about your guilt or innocent, is Miranda an issue? Remember, Miranda falls in, you need two prongs, custody and interrogation. You need those things for Miranda. you got to have the person in custody, and you need interrogation about the crime. But if I detain you, are you in custody? Custody is in the mind of the individual who is detained. It, would a reasonable person believe they have the right to leave? And when you're detained, you do not have the right to leave. So therefore, is there custody? I would say yes. Uh, he, he has been detained under the Fourth Amendment, I agree. And if you arrest him, you said I place you under arrest. It would be he is arrest. in custody when he's placed under arrest. There's no doubt but about that. you say that. there's a distinction between a stop on reasonable suspicion for necessity warning and a formal arrest. Yes, correct. I, I just, 
it seems to me that uh, it would not even well, be workable in such a situation. Is he situation. free to move about at will when he's been stopped? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first is part. Is he please. free to move about when he's been stopped by the police? Um, no, he is not. He he has been detained, but whether that is uh, a what, what, the person what's, is what's in, the reason for a distinction in terms of Miranda? The reasons behind the Miranda rule. Why would you draw that line? I wonder. Well, again, I'm relying on cases like Orozco uh, and Miranda, and the situation in uh, Oregon versus Mathiason, where the court uh, Oregon versus Mathiason involved a situation where a person was under suspicion and had been asked to voluntarily come down to the police station. He was, he voluntarily came, but you don't voluntarily agree to be stopped. That's a, correct. But he he was in he was in a policeman's office for two hours or so, locked up there, and this court held that no Miranda warnings were required. But isn't it, by and hypothesis, I, isn't, a, isn't a Terry stop involuntary? Isn't, isn't that sort of the... I, I, I think there's no doubt that there's some element of involuntariness in it, that the person is detained. I mean, the, the whole thrust of, of Terry was that the Fourth Amendment is involved in those situations. Well, you're certainly restrained if someone is searching you for weapons. That's true. Uh, but isn't the genesis of the whole Terry concept that it's part of an investigation for possible criminal activity? Well, that, that's the point I was making. The, the person, the... It, it, the isn't just to, it isn't just to see whether the man's got a gun. The primary thrust is to investigate possible criminal activity. But in that process, this court has said they may search the person to see whether he's got a gun, and that's a prophylactic thing so that the officer doesn't uh, That's correct. Kill. They can pat him down, frisk him, uh, to see if he has The justice said search. There's a difference between a frisk and a pat down and a search. Remember, penetrating pockets, penetrating clothing, pat down and frisk, or outer clothing, filling and rubbing only, not going in and intruding to grab things. Then it becomes a search. Again, if, if circumstances are present, which indicate that, uh, they so that there, is a, there is an element of detention very clearly. Oh, I'm not arguing that there isn't under Terry in a but, situation like this, but it but is it not. It has never been thought in the, it has never been suggested in any opinion that that detention or custody, whatever it may be, triggers the Miranda warning. I, I'm not familiar with any suggestion that it would be uh, applicable. I, I just don't see how it would be. That's right. Reading Terry into the words lawfully stopped, looking through the record there, I don't know that the court below ever considered Terry. And I can't see simply by saying a state legislature putting in the words lawful or unlawful reads in or reads out Supreme Court decisions. And under the, uh, the decision in this, in this court, Connolly versus General Construction Company, the terms of a penal statute creating a new offense must be sufficiently explicit to inform those who are subject to it. That's the test of vagueness, not that some court someplace may be able to read in, tarry, or read it out in a particular situation. Otherwise, all you have to do to make a statute uh, pass the vagueness test here would be to, just to put in the words lawfully stopped or unlawful detention or whatever you may uh, want to read into the statute by those words. But don't many statutes, in fact, do that? For instance, criminal trespass statute says unlawfully on the premises. And uh, it may be a question of considerable doubt in that particular case whether a person is or is not lawfully on the premises. I agree with you, sir. In the situation where you read in the words lawful, there are other standards. For example, unlawfully on the premises normally takes to mean you're on the premises and you don't have permission to be there. But the words lawfully stopped are so vague, it's a question of degree, I agree with you. It, they are so vague, lawfully stopped, that in this case, for example, this court, under f facts that I would consider that there was not a lawful stop, simply stopping a person uh, in an alley who had not been doing anything wrong, no, no suspicion or report that he had been doing anything wrong, court held below that it was a lawful stop. Now, what the court did below, the court had serious reservations about the constitutionality of the statute, but simply presumed that the statute was valid and read into the statute, apparently, that this was also uh, a... You'll notice if you watch a lot of these hearings, the justices tend to interrupt more on the person they rule against. So they're going to rule with this guy, and you notice 
they allow him to speak and make his points without interrupting him. You notice they were interrupting the government more on this case than they are him, which normally leads you to believe which way the court is leaning. A valid stop as applied in this particular case. Now, if the stop had been unlawful, necessarily my, my client would have been acquitted and you would not be reviewing the statute. If the stop is lawful, excuse me, if the stop was unlawful under the facts of the case, then it would be like Norwell, where you simply find that there was protected activity and there reached the constitutional issue by that means. And incidentally, in Norwell versus Cincinnati, I went back and looked at it, you, this court did say we are persuaded that the ordinance as applied to this petitioner on the facts of this case operated to punish his constitutionally protected speech. So that was decided on First Amendment grounds. The Fifth, the fifth Amendment question in this case, it's very difficult sometimes to see how the invocation of the right to, under the Fifth Amendment, can be valid when it applies to a name only. However, in a situation where, for example, I saw a case out of Texas, the Miller case cited in the brief, where a person had made a false claim for insurance, claiming he was dead, the claim was made through his wife. Later on, he was arrested. Had he given his name of Joe Dokes or anything else, that person, they never would have put the crime well, together. Well, aren't you confusing probable cause with incriminating? <laughs> That's a pretty good case. <laughs> that brings up an interesting point. If your name isn't protected under self-incrimination, the Fifth Amendment protects you from self-incriminating. You can't be compelled by government to give evidence against yourself. It's the the government's job to prove that you're guilty. It's not your job to help them. So that's what the Fifth Amendment protects. However, if your wife put in a claim that says you're dead and giving your name would be used against you in order to convict of the insurance fraud, wouldn't your name be protected under the Fifth Amendment? I say it would be. The disclosure of the name may lead to the arrest, but the disclosure of the name per se doesn't incriminate him. It merely sets in motion a chain of events that will bring him into court. Isn't that also incrimination? Incrimination goes beyond mere evidence presented in court. Incrimination means something that may subject me to prosecution, and I can't see how you can totally separate the concepts of evidence in court and probable cause, also evidence to give someone a reasonable cause to arrest a person. I, separating the two, um, I have a difficult time with that. To me, they're both incrimination. One allows evidence to be presented in court. The other one allows my arrest. Uh, in either case, it's incrimination. But reaching the, the cost, how would you ever, under the facts of this case, how would you ever test the constitutionality of this statute uh, if you didn't get beyond the facts of this particular case and find out whether there was constitutionally protected conduct which was being punished by the statute here, which is exactly what appellant is trying to do? And is there constitutionally protected conduct which this, the statute in this case makes criminal. Fact is, you do have the right to walk down the street and stand mute. Under the case Norwell versus Cincinnati, you do have the right to, to walk down the street and tell a policeman, I don't want to tell you anything. Well, he did more than that. He, he verbally and negatively protested. Now, in your case, you don't have anything said at all. Yes, we do, Your Honor. My client said, he protested the reason and the right of the officers to stop him. Yes, but he's, he's being uh, arrested for not speaking to it, identifying himself. I think it's a very different case from Norwell. I think your First Amendment argument is frivolous. Right. Yeah, under Norwell, whether Norwell was being prosecuted for saying something or not doing something, the point is that in that case, this court held that it was constitutionally protected speech. In other words, telling the police officer, I don't want to tell you anything, this court held was constitutionally protected speech. If someone is asking my name and I tell them, I don't want to tell you anything. Of course it protects speech. That's the First Amendment. The question here is there's a lack of speech. <laughs> All right, then you get closer. What I'm saying is I think you have much stronger arguments on other fifth. amendments than you do on the First Amendment, and I think you're spinning your wheels here. Well, the First Amendment claim I see is very He's already told him, look, dude, 
your First Amendment ain't going to get our ruling. Stop saying it's a First Amendment issue. The real problem, not so, aside from the Norwell case, the case of a person who wishes anonymously to protest, goes to a meeting but doesn't want anyone to know that he is there. I think it's a very real problem. You want to pin your case in the First Amendment? I think it ought to be pinned on the First, Fourth, and Fifth. Your Honor, they all are bundled so close together that I don't think any one amendment ought to decide this case. I think this is a group of, of rights that are so close in this case. Well, maybe one of the troubles of the case, you have a shotgun approach here on everything uh, possible. Man, this judge is doing everything like, dude, drop the freaking first. Argue where you have good standing and drop the first. I'm not saying I disagree that I don't think he should have to tell him his name, but this justice is giving him hints. Go where the meat's at. Stop freaking picking through your peas and get to the meat. Well, it may be a shotgun approach, but I legitimately believe that the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments all protect the conduct in this case. Thank you, gentlemen. The case is submitted. We'll, the case is submitted. We'll hear arguments next. The case is submitted. All righty. Well, um, and of course, we all know how they ruled. The court had held that the Fourth Amendment covers all police seizures, even those as brief as prevented a person from walking away, which is a detention, Im impacting your free movement. The Fourth Amendment requires that such seizures be based on specific and objective facts that create a, compel a compelling public interest in the seizure that outweighs the individual's expectation of privacy. In this case, the, the court held that the police officer lacked any, not reasonable, lacked any reasonable suspicion based on objective fact to allow them to detain Brown and question him. Why did they rule that? Because the cop said all I wanted to do was ID him. That's why they ruled that. Articulation by the cop. Uh, detain Brown, since the seizure was not lawful, the Texas statute requiring Brown to identify himself, did not apply. And that is the case for Brown versus Texas. Why you don't have to ID the cop unless you're suspected of a crime. All righty, we'll end that there.